Right. That, of course, was a scene from The Princess Bride, where Princess Buttercup and Wesley are trying to brave the fire swamp, and they encounter some quicksand. Princess Buttercup falls in, sinks into the quicksand, Wesley cuts the vine, jumps in after her and saves her, and, of course, they're both okay. And um, quicksand is kind of a legendary thing, right? People think that you can go buy a bag of quicksand at the store, fill up a hole with it, and then if people fall in, they'll sink into it. Of course, the reality is a little bit different from that, but quicksand does exist um, in real life. And so let me switch to, uh, let's see, do this one. Um, let me switch to this um, PDF file again on my notes, and I'll show you a condition that can result in quicksand actually forming. So um, common occurrence here, like in uh, Santa Monica and other parts near the ocean, is where we have these coastal bluffs, like, uh, let's see, move that there, like um, this bluff right here, and then you come down and there's a nice beach, and then here's the ocean, right? And there's a wave to show you that that's the ocean. Well, uh, oftentimes the water table in the rock is pretty low, right? Maybe down here, and so there's no real seepage happening. But sometimes what will happen is there will be rainfall, okay? And rock is generally jointed, right? It's, it's unusual to have really intact rock, like what you would have at Half Dome or up Capitan or something like that up in Yosemite, big solid monoliths of granite. Rock usually has sets of joints in them, and water can flow through those joints pretty quickly. In fact, the hydraulic conductivity of rock is almost entirely controlled by the joints rather than the water flowing through the material itself. So the rainwater is able to infiltrate into the rock pretty quickly. And what will happen is you get this elevated water table in the rock, and meanwhile, the rain that falls here just washes into the ocean, so you keep a fairly low water table at the beach. Well, as a result, you have high pressure here, and the water is coming up through those rock joints, and you're getting upward flow of water through the sand. So what can happen temporarily is that that upward flow can result in a condition of zero effective stress, and the sand will be quicksand, right? It won't have any strength or stiffness. If you were to walk on it, you might sink into it. Uh, but here's the thing, the total unit weight of the sand is much higher than the unit weight of our bodies, right? Our bodies are about the same unit weight as water, whereas um, saturated sand is maybe twice as much. So if you were to sink into quicksand, you wouldn't disappear like Princess Buttercup did. You might go in up to your waist or something like that before you became buoyant in the sand and you wouldn't sink any further. So just don't go into head, uh, quicksand head first, right? Go feet first, and you, you'll be able to get out and be okay. So um, let's talk about the critical hydraulic gradient, or uh, what we call I sub C. Um, that's the um, vertical hydraulic gradient required to cause vertical effective stress to be equal to zero. And this is a really important concept when we do seepage analyses. A lot of the time we will look at the vertical exit gradient, like where the water is exiting underneath a levee, for example, or a dam. And we'll make sure that that vertical exit gradient is adequately smaller than the critical hydraulic gradient. Because we don't want soil to become quicksand, right? It loses strength and stiffness, the dam or levee might fail as a result. So it's important for us to be able to derive that critical hydraulic gradient. So what I've done is set up a little schematic here. We have some soil right there, indicated with those little dots. The height of the soil is H. Then there's some height of the water above the soil and um, on, the, on top of it. And then on the left side, we've raised up the water level by an amount of delta H right there. So we're pushing water upward through this soil. And if we push the water upward, um, with enough hydraulic gradient, it will eventually result in a condition of zero effective stress. So what we'll do is look at point C. It turns out when the effective stress is zero at point C, it's also zero everywhere within the soil, um, as long as the hydraulic conductivity is uniform. So we're assuming K is constant here. So at point C, the vertical total stress is equal to gamma W H W. Remember, we always have to integrate downward from the very top surface, either a water-air interface or a soil-air interface. 
So we have to include that water. So sigma V is gamma W H W plus gamma saturated times H. Since the soil is below the water table, it's going to be saturated. Then the pore pressure at point C, so the total stress was controlled by all this stuff happening above it. The pore pressure is controlled by that water surface over there. So it's equal to gamma W times H plus HW plus this delta H, right? That's the height between point C and the controlling water surface. So sigma V prime is simply sigma V minus U, and you end up getting gamma sat H minus gamma W times H plus delta H. So this HW term actually goes away. It cancels out when you do the subtraction. So what we need to do now is set sigma V prime equal to zero because that's what we're interested in understanding, right? How big does the hydraulic gradient need to be when sigma V prime is zero? And then we solve for the hydraulic gradient, the critical hydraulic gradient, which is delta H over H when sigma V prime is zero. So here we have zero is equal to gamma sat minus gamma W times one plus IC. So I've done this substitution throughout the uh, equation. And then we can solve for I sub C. It's just equal to gamma sat minus gamma W divided by gamma W. And recall that this quantity on the top, gamma saturated minus gamma W, is simply equal to the buoyant unit weight gamma prime. So that's another way of thinking about it, gamma prime over gamma W. Very simple. Um, okay, so I sub C is a vertical hydraulic gradient. It's important to remember that. Um, it's possible to have, and, and further, it's an upward vertical hydraulic gradient. It's possible to have a downward vertical hydraulic gradient if you're forcing water down into the soil, uh, but that's going to actually increase the effective stress because the seepage force is acting down in the direction of gravity. What we're worried about is whether the upward vertical hydraulic gradient is bigger than I sub C. That's a condition that we need to worry about. All right, the next thing I'll talk about is artesian pressure. So um, a, a common... Um, sort of setup that results in artesian pressure is if you have a levee that's uh, holding back water and the water level is higher than the ground surface, right? So in this case, like the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta has this condition, you have water up here basically at sea level and then the elevation of the land is as much as 30 feet below sea level in some cases. And uh, the levees protect the what are called the islands, the interior space from flooding. Well, let's say that you have this peat layer, right? Organic soil, the delta has a lot of peat. And um, underneath the peat, you have sand, right? So down here is sand. And then in the channel, you have sand. Usually where there's water, um, the peat has been eroded away and you have inorganic sediments that might be sandy over here and then beneath the peat. Okay, the, the hydraulic conductivity of the peat is quite a bit lower than sand, right? Maybe a few orders of magnitude. We'll just say it's, it's much, much lower than sand. What that means is that as the water is flowing through the sand underneath and then up through the peat, almost all of the head loss happens in the peat, not in the sand. So if we were to come to this point right beneath the, the bottom of the peat in the sand and put a well, like we drilled a hole and put a pipe down there and then measured how high that water would rise in the pipe, it would actually come up above the ground surface. Right? It would come up to an elevation that's almost equal to the water level in the channel because there's very little head loss through the sand. Right? If there was no head loss through the sand, the water in the standpipe here would actually rise to the same level as the water in the channel. But because there is a little bit of head loss through the sand, it's slightly lower, but it's still above the ground surface. All right, artesian pressures can be good and they can be bad, depending on what you're doing. If you're a farmer and you want to irrigate crops, Artesian pressure is really good because you can drill a hole in the ground down to a permeable layer and water will just flow out on its own. You don't need a pump. Parts of Los Angeles had artesian pressures in the San Fernando Valley and LA Valley because the San Gabriel Mountains held a lot of water and the water would flow up through the sediments. Um, that's all gone now. We've pumped all the water out. But um, anyway, for farmers, it can be a good thing. For geotechnical engineers, it's a bad thing, right? It means that the effective stress down here in the sand is low because, and, and all through the peat is low because you've got this big upward seepage force happening. And if you were to drill a hole through the peat 
and, and, and water started coming up through that hole and carrying sand with it, it might create a seep that's really hard to, um, uh, to, to fix, right? You could start getting erosion. Maybe you would have to build a bunch of sandbags up to allow the water to come up and back pressure the seep before it fails. All right, let's move on now to talking about liquefaction. So um, liquefaction is a condition of sigma V prime equals zero. So it's kind of a subset of quicksand. Um, the, the difference between quicksand that's due to upward seepage and liquefaction is just the source of excess pore pressure. So when we're talking about um, you know the condition like the levee or like these uh, coastal bluffs holding high water level and, and upward seepage right there. What's causing the quicksand in that case is an elevated water table that's pushing water up through the sand. In the case of liquefaction, it's a little bit more complicated. The excess pore pressure comes from shearing. So we know that in undrained loading, a contractive soil will produce positive excess pore pressure when it's sheared. So. Um, if there is some shear applied to the soil and it undergoes some shear strain and starts producing positive excess pore pressure, the amount of excess pore pressure can actually become big enough that there's no more effective stress and you basically reach the condition that's similar to the quicksand condition. So liquefaction can occur during cyclic loading, like during earthquakes. Sand particles that are loose and shaken by an earthquake will just get disturbed and lose contact with each other and produce excess pore pressure. Um, it could also be caused by monotonic undrain loading. So um, if you just apply a big monotonic stress quickly to the sand such that the water can't get out quickly, um, it may produce enough excess pore pressure that it will um, liquefy. And of course it loses a lot of strength and bad things can happen um, when liquefaction happens.